I want to introduce myself really, really quickly. My name is Matt Hamilton. I'm the program director for the Michigan Learning Channel. Um, and we are so, so thrilled to be able to partner with Shannon McCartney and Strategic Intervention Solutions um, around the Math Mites. So if you're not familiar with Michigan Learning Channel, we are a um, public media partnership. We partner with PBS um, nationally, but also specifically with six public media stations across Michigan in order to get educational productions, educational TV and programming on um, our 24 seven TV channel that airs across Michigan, but also online on a live stream and via digital resources for families, students and teachers in communities across the state. One of our favorite shows that we share is Math Mites, um, which is one of our shorter shows um, that is, I say shorter because it's not a half hour show. A lot of our programming is a half hour, um, but really it's just the right amount of time for our um, kindergarten through third grade learners and the teachers or families that work with them um, to, to teach some of this really, really innovative um, mathematics learning development. And so we are so thrilled to have Shannon here with us, who's the creator of the Math Mites, all the fun characters and the thinking behind the programming. Um, Shannon, I know, runs around so busy offering professional development to <laughs> teachers and coaches um, in our state, nationally and internationally, because she just returned from a, a trip abroad um, sharing all the amazing work that she does. So we are absolutely lucky to have her and be offering this um, free professional development today. Um, so we're here in the space together, and I want to encourage everybody to use the chat as you have questions, as you have feedback. Um, I'll try to post links as stuff comes up. And if you do share questions in the chat, there will be space where we'll try to answer those before the end of the time here. I don't want to take up any more time. I want to turn it over to our host, Shannon. Thanks so much for doing this for us, Shannon. Great. I'm super excited to be here today. Uh, we have four different programs that we've kind of put together for our um, session. So it'll fit different grades for different, um, you know, teachers in your school district. This one's going to be primarily on numeracy development. So it's going to focus on kids, maybe like the age two, all the way up to um, numeracy really even goes up to third grade. So we have a lot of kids that are lacking in development. So in our program today, we'll kind of peel back the layers in math. A lot of times we're really good at doing it in reading with math, but as we look, or we do this in reading by peeling back the layers and when we think of math, it's kind of like turning the page in the book. So it's kind of interesting to sort of see what are the layers as to why students might not be getting some of the things that, um, that we're doing. So if you aren't familiar um, with the math mites, this is kind of our Halloween math mite that I have behind us. Um, so we're kind of, you know, happy Halloween to everyone from our math mite friends and all their different costumes that they have on from the math mites. Um, I'm the creator of the math mite characters, um, and it kind of has stemmed from a lot of work that I've done over the past 10 years, um, really looking in the area of math. My background is very unique. I um, have a special education background, a general education background, and most people find it shocking that I have a reading specialist. So I come from really taking the ideas of reading and really implementing it um, into math. And so um, I own Strategic Intervention Solutions, which is an educational consulting company that does professional development and job embedded coaching um, for schools all over Michigan. I saw we have someone here from Nashville. I also present in Nashville. Um, so I go to different states and, um, and also some other different countries. I'd encourage you today, if you're an educator, to follow us on any of the platforms. If you just search at SIS for teachers to work, we're trying to build our Instagram following. Um, we have a lot of different like folders now on there with the math mites and different strategies that are being in classrooms that you can see. And then on the other side of the page, you see our mathmites.org page, which runs along with the Michigan Learning Channel. We have lots of different lesson planning and all the background of why um, I picked the certain things for the shows. I'm the second grade teacher on the show, um, but I wrote and produced all of the shows that we've created that are on the, um, the Michigan Learning Channel. And you also can follow us on social media. We do have a special offer just for you for watching the webinar. It'll last for a month. Um, we have a code SIS 15 MLC and our um, shopping uh, in our cart at SIS for 
forward slash shop if you want to check out any of um, the fun things that we're talking about, obviously, in the area of numeracy. And so as we um, kind of get started, I know a lot of you might be on the phone or you might be, you know, leaving work or um, in different areas. So if you're able to verbally respond, that's awesome. If you can't, um, I totally, I totally understand. Um, but I kind of want to look at this idea of why more and more kids are coming to school lacking in numeracy development. So if you kind of put your math hat on for a minute and sort of think about the students that are coming into your schools, whether um, you're from one area or another across the state of Michigan or across our country, um, what are some of the things that you're seeing of the littles that are kind of coming in not so much think like literacy, but thinking of numeracy. Is there anything anyone wants to share about what they notice about kids coming to school in the area of numeracy? The picture is giving a good hint. So, right. <laughs> so we kind of have what I call like Shannon's top five things that, um, that, you know, that might be a reason why students are coming you know, into school lacking um, numeracy. Even if you are a fourth grade teacher or you even teach, you know, preschool or kindergarten or even are homeschooling your kids, we see a lot of kids coming to school lacking in these five areas. So we kind of talk to teachers about really understanding this area, these areas. So I'll kind of give you, I'll give you one of the areas. One of the things that we see kids in school lacking is our number one thing is with your experiences with real objects in the physical world. So many of our kids are plugged in when we go on home visits to preschool programs or in homes. Oftentimes we see a device. We don't see, um, you know, glitter and Play-Doh because those things are messy, right? A lot of times you don't see a lot of board games or things that are really hands-on. Um, I travel a lot in my life and so I oftentimes just kind of observe families and see that there isn't often a lot of play going on because a child might have a device. And so we get kids that are coming in, especially I'm up in the Upper Peninsula right now, working with Lance schools this week. Um, and, um, you know, we see a lot of the kindergartners here that kind of were like the COVID babies that are really struggling and a lot of just real objects in the physical world in all of our schools, really across the country and the younger grades that are just, they're plugged in and they're not, they're not necessarily getting those hands-on experiences experiences like you or I would. If you think about when we were younger, we had a big pile of Legos and, you know, you would create whatever you wanted to create out of that, that Lego set. But if you look at Legos today, they're kind of all set up, like build this now, next, don't think, do this. And then, you know, my son is going to be 14, but we had a lot of little like Lego sets all around the house and they kind of built this certain thing, but there wasn't really any of the creativity that you and I would with the big bucket of Legos, or I'm going to put this Lego on this side and I might want to put wheels on it. But if I try to push it, if it doesn't go, then I realize you know, I need to kind of change something in the structure of how that is. So our number one thing that I want to remember is that our kids are not getting sufficient learning experiences with real objects in the physical world. Our second thing that we see um, is oral language, very much like reading, you know, at dinner tables and conversations are not happening. Kids go in the car and they're on a device and the mom or dad is on a device or parents are working. Um, we always hear, read to your kids, definitely read to your kids, but parents don't hear about, you know, the quantitative language that we should be talking about with just oral language. So what are things that we could be talking about? You know, what are we doing today? Um, what are all of the conversations about what kids are thinking. Um, a lot of our kids are really good um, with receptive language, which, you know, they can kind of, you know, put this certain thing here or no, but they're not very good with their expressive language. And when it comes to math, that's kind of a huge area um, for a lot of kids. Another thing that is really big is we're going to talk about this today is kinesthetic development. Um, I had the opportunity last week to go back to a school district in between St. Uh, actually an island in between St. Kit and St. Martin um, called St. Astatius. 3,400 people um, live there, but using their, their own by the Dutch, uh, the Netherlands, and they, you know, follow the Dutch kind of way of education. So they group one and group two students there 
are like our kind of like our kindergartners, but they're four and five years old um, and getting videos of looking at kids skipping or kids crossing their midline and getting one side of their brain to talk to the other side of their brain was so interesting just to look at kids from all over. And the, the commonality is the kids on the island look just like the kids here in the United States they don't really have a lot of the um, those pieces that look at it. So today we'll talk about why kinesthetic development is really important. A great thing to remember is the readiness to learn. So if you looked at your class, even if you taught second grade, you line up your kids on one side of the blacktop and you say, hey, go ahead and skip across the blacktop. I could watch your kids while coaching at your school and ask you if the three students in your classroom that can't skip, I'll ask you if they have math problems or they're struggling in math. And teachers always say, Shannon, how did you know that? So skipping and rhythmic motion um, it beat competency relates to math. If we were looking at the brain for reading, it would be kids doing static and dynamic balance. So putting their arms out, maybe closing their eyes and counting to 10 with one leg up or walking heel to toe. Um, if kids can't do that, that's balance for your brain to kind of be ready for reading. So those are really great, interesting things to think about for kids, um, you know, when we're thinking about kinesthetic. I don't know about your school, but I'm in hundreds of classrooms everywhere and kids are not very good at problem solving. They oftentimes, um, you know, when the going gets tough in math or in school, they kind of what I call like just drop the mic. They don't, they want the teacher to do it. Um, we have a lot of helicopter parents. We also have a lot of parents that, you know, might not be there for kids, all different types of areas that we kind of go into to see. But kids today, it doesn't matter of their socioeconomic background, a lot of our kids suffer from the disease of entitlement and instant gratification. And it's nothing to do with, you know, money. It has to do more with, hey, Siri, what is this? Or getting X. And when I say to my kids, I had to go to the library, look at the card catalog. And like, you know, I mean, we talk about my mom, you know, saying those things like she walked up, you know, in the snow. Um, but, you know, when you think about that, kids get things instantly in technology today. Um, and so when the going gets tough and they have to actually question their own metacognition, kids are out. They don't want to do it. And so a lot of our kids are lacking in that. And our younger kids that run into trouble and can't really, you know, work their way through different things um, struggle in the area of math. The last part is kind of hard to guess, but it's visual memory. The population of kids that we're working with today has one of the weakest visual memories, I think, of any of the children in even the past five or 10 years, because all the digital images are provided in their brain. If I asked you, hey, what did you have for dinner last night? You might say, um, I don't know. I have to think about that, right? If I asked kids, hey, what video game did you play or what game on your phone did you play or what movie did you watch? They can instantly tell you. Kids have a hard time picturing things in their brain, whether they're learning letters and sounds or numbers or thinking of number quantity. They have a hard time picturing that and then being able to tell you about it because of their plugged in world. We have five top things. We have, you know, looking back at the things we talked about, real objects in the physical world. We have the oral language. We have kids kinesthetic development, their visual memory, as well as problem solving. And these are kind of the main root of where we start our schools, really looking at our younger students to figure out kind of where things are. So I want you to think of layers. Like you probably know this really well, especially if you're an elementary person for reading. I could peel back the layers in reading really well for students, but when it comes to math, they're counting on their fingers. I don't know why. I don't know what's wrong. I'm just going to keep doing the things I'm doing. And so there's actually layers that our brain kind of goes through. So we're going to kind of go a little bit through this pyramid as we look at um, where kids are. So I want you to think of an onion and we're like peeling the layers down to maybe a two-year-old and maybe in a lot of homes that have really great oral language and interaction with children that aren't plugged in as much. I would say this level could certainly start even at one or one and a half, um, but it's called real objects in the physical world. And what it means is that we give kids experiences in math before we really even realize it. So 
students that are, you know, at a young age start to understand the awareness of distance by climbing, reaching, going for walks, maybe pushing toys. They start to understand the awareness of weight by holding things that might be heavy versus light or being able to maybe carry rocks or climbing or pushing toys. The early awareness of, um, of really patterns or the arrangements of things. So if you're setting a table, when my son was younger, he could do, you know, a plate with the cup on top and a fork, but as long as all four place settings looked the same, it was the same idea. Planting a garden, cutting, drawing, crafting, skipping, all these things are helping kids to have those early on experiences of awareness of patterns, awareness of frequency. So taking turns, um, even if you're driving in the car and, you know, you tell the kids, okay, I'm going to count the red cars, you count the trucks, um, how often something is happening um, around them. A lot of students have a hard time at a young age starting to develop the idea of awareness of time. Like I know I'm really sad right now that it's getting so dark at night so early uh, in the mornings when I left, it was dark. Um, but, you know, we used to do links, you know, counting down to flag football. How many more night nights, mommy, until, you know, we're going to go to flag football. Every time my son Connor would take off a link, he knew four more night nights we to play flag football. And so a lot of kids um, start to learn the ideas of the awareness of time. And then the awareness of equations just is so eye-opening to me um, when we see things on a playground, which when I was on the island of Asia, they had a teeter-totter or, or a seesaw on every playground. When is the last time that you have seen a teeter-totter or a seesaw on a playground? Not many, but yet when you're in first grade, you need to know if three plus four equals five plus one. Is that true or false? The balanced equations, right? Sand and water tables, you know, teeter-totters when kids are on seesaws, trying to figure out how much weight one side is versus the other, um, sharing portions of food. And so we're asked at a very young age, uh, too young maybe, to kind of balance equations when yet we haven't had those learning experiences that we might need. So your takeaway message, the first takeaway message hopefully was the five reasons why kids are coming to school lacking in the area of numeracy. Your takeaway message here is that children will develop symbolic thinking skills only after they've had sufficient learning experiences with real objects in the physical world. Would you say that you agree with that? Makes sense, right? What is the one thing that we take out of early childhood? It starts with a P. Play, right? We Play. have less and less play. Yeah, that's happening. And the sand and water tables, not in your, um, in your, you know, particular, um, you know, classroom anymore. There isn't the puppet show. There isn't kids doing all these different things to be able to have those sufficient learning experiences. So if you aren't getting that in a lot of the schools where I do a lot of curriculum mapping, we create a soft start for our kindergartners and we design with the standards, don't worry, um, a unit around play to get kids to get those experiences. We see kids that come in and they roll the die and they count the space that they're on because they've never actually rolled the die and played a game to know exactly where they're going with different things in this early area. And so this early area of, you know, numeracy really is at the forefront of it. And so a really great thing for you to go to is on our website at SIS, the number four teachers.org. There's a ton of free resources. Um, I have a whole math for little series that I've created and that is on our free part of our site. Um, and you can go there and if you're at preschool or if you, um, you know, even at kindergarten roundup, kind of sharing with families that mathematical thinking is really all around us, that there are opportunities to talk about math in the bathroom. There's opportunities in the kitchen, in the yard, even in the home, in the family room or the bedroom, where numeracy is kind of all about uh, all, all around us. So as we look at the website, if you go to my series, this is sisforteachers.org. If you go to my math for littles, which is really what this topic is talking about, the other webinars will get into obviously different age groups. But if you click on real objects in the physical world, parents can watch a really simple 
video that I created that will tell them how to create a math friendly um, home. And then there's a little handout that you can download and maybe put that on the bathroom mirror and remember to talk to your kids about these certain things that are happening, um, you know, in our, in the real world that, you know, kids might need um, different conversations that they can do. So hopefully our first layer that we're talking about makes sense. It's real objects in the physical world. And this is where kids need thousands and thousands and thousands of experiences. Just like in reading, you say, man, if the kid had more oral language, they would be so much ready for so much of the things that we're doing. Now, I can't hook a vacuum up to kids and pump in all language experiences and all the experiences with real objects in the physical world. Um, but the more or that we can make parents aware. I do a lot of parent training um, with early childhood and even just in elementary talking about um, the shift in math. But the more we can get parents to understand the layer, the more we have kids that kind of come into school with some of these things. The next layer is looking at our um, kinesthetic. And I can promise you if you're in an elementary building, no math books. I work with nine different math series, pretty close to probably 10. And a lot of our M3 molding math mindset schools, whether you have your math, my math, go math, you know, uh, math focus, math expressions, I can go on and on and on. I want to say I don't love any of the programs fully. There's certain parts of the program that I like, but they don't often honor numeracy in the way that our kids are coming in today. So one of the layers we're going to talk about next, and if there's questions, pop them in the chat or just unmute and you can let me know as we go, super laid back as we go through these um, concepts. The kinesthetic learning experience is by far for our molding math mindset schools that are our project schools that we work with for several years on this is probably one of the most eye-opening areas when we look at kids, kinesthetic one-to-ones. So I want you to think of if you were going to try to have a pile of counters, let's say, and you say, okay, Johnny, I want you to count the counters. Johnny moves the counter and goes one, you say to him, do one, two, three. Okay. Now you go ahead and do it. And the kid goes one, two, three, four. And you're like, no, you don't even have it. That is at the concrete level. So if we go back and look at the pyramid, that's in the green bar. That's a concrete tool, a child having what's called concrete one-to-one -one correspondence. We find that many kids do not have what is called kinesthetic one-to-one -one correspondence. And ironically, Jerry, who's on the call today, is in one of our project schools in Aw Gray Sims. She's a teacher that's new to the district. This was actually filmed in your in your district, Jerry. I want you to pay attention to these two girls, and I want you to tell me which child has what's called kinesthetic one-to-one -one correspondence and which one doesn't. What you're trying to listen for in this video is, is the child walking on the poly spots with one-to-one -one correspondence? So let's watch this just for a second to see how these kids do. Go ahead. Perfect. Go on. Here's Jordan. Getting again. This time I want you to go to the number five and stop. Go ahead. Excellent. Go ahead and go back. Nice job, honey. Go on back. This time you're going to walk to the number eight. Get to three. Okay, so this student we can see has what we call kinesthetic one to one. She's walking on our poly spots. We don't have a lot of you on the video camera, but I want to see what is it you notice that's not poly spots. There's a number line going one to 10, but it doesn't have what? Jerry, good job. She said it doesn't have numbers on it, right? It has quantities on it. Why should a kinesthetic number line not have digits or numbers on it? Because the symbol is four and you say walk to the number four. So I walk 
and I land on that symbol. That's not looking at what we call counting and cardinality to see does that child know that four is one, two, three, four. Now I want to watch the next student and see if she has kinesthetic one to one. Oh, good. Okay, go on back. This time I'm going to see doing the same thing, but stop at five. Go slow. Ready? Go to the number five. Count. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, go back up to that one more time to go to the five. She was really okay. active. Count and walk your steps to the five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, what number are you on? Count those dots. What number? One, two, three, four. Oh, and walk your steps to the number six. One, two, three, four, five, six. She's about done with me here. <laughs> okay, is that six? Uh -huh. Okay, how do you know it's six? Because I walked all the way down here. You walked all the way down here. Now we're going to watch to see. So a part of our, we have a whole series of numeracy screeners that we are, we have a whole new set of screeners that are coming out that I've been researching on for the last 10 years and they are launching this month. If you're not a part of our social media, I would recommend you following us on it because I'm super excited for them to come out, publish some screeners about 10 years ago and we kind of revised them with 21st century, but this is one of our preschool screeners. And if any kindergarten student does not pass our numeracy screener, we have to peel back and go back to see how kids are doing um, over here. So I want you to watch for a second on this without stepping stones. So I'm going to ask the girls to walk without the poly spots to see. And count your steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And count and walk your steps to me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Count and walk your steps to me. Nine. So as we can see, these two kids look different. These were kids I just pulled out of a kindergarten class when I was working with the interventionist in this particular district, um, looking at peeling back the layers and we create what are called intervention kits together um, for math. But previous to that, I was teaching in the kindergarten classroom um, and I pulled out a few different students that I was really wondering kind of how they were doing with some of the concepts that were being taught. And it told me a lot about these two girls. You could probably predict that the child in the classroom um, is not one-to-one -one counting well with counters, um, is struggling in a lot of different areas. Um, but the cool part with that girl, you're able to set up an intervention 10 minutes a day. She wasn't the only kid having issues in that classroom um, five days a week. So 50 minutes on the exact instructional match for three weeks. And I reassessed her. And the cool part was she had it on the poly spot. She did not yet have it just walking. But I want you to realize if we go unnoticed in this particular level, we won't really get kids to develop this layer. And it's very easy to develop it, but a lot of kids aren't outside crossing midline and doing a lot of these things. So we have a slew of activities for teachers that they can use um, in their classroom, different patterns happening. Even if you did one, two, three, four, and the kids were counting, um, you could have them count and walk their steps. We use the poly spots that you saw in the video. We do bean bags. One of my favorite books way back when I went to Michigan State University was uh, Mathematics Their Way. If you Google search Mathematics Their Way, the author has passed away and the book is free online. It was written in the 70s. It's an oldie book goodie. And if you've been teaching for a while, you probably have this book, um, but it is filled with this layer. It's called the Kinesthetic Learning Experience um, for Young Children and has all kinds of great activities to get kids to really get um get this layer. And so the kinesthetic layer, layer I want you to think about, because I have a reading specialist, so I always try to compare what it is we know about reading to what we know about math. So in reading this layer, so our real objects in the physical world is our oral language, right? Because that's like your oral language play for math. The kinesthetic learning experience is kind of like rhyming. So if I say cat, hat, give me a word that rhymes, and the kid says water bottle, and you're like, no, let's try it again. Bear, chair, and they say phone, because that's what's on the table. You say, nope, you don't have rhyming, go back to class. 
You've been there. If you've worked with young kids, you cannot make a child rhyme. I can sing, I can dance, I can play Jack Hartman stuff or Heidi songs. But at the end of the day, the child has to hear the rhyme and supply the rhyme. Rhyming is the same for kinesthetic. Either a kid has it or they don't. I personally cannot make a child have what's called kinesthetic one-to-one -one correspondence. I can walk on those poly spots all day and have them slow down and try to walk their steps. But at the end of the day, the child has to get the patterning of the one-to-one. -one. And so it's a great um, it's a great way to look to see either kids have it or they don't. And just today in the school that I was with, in, uh, the Upper Peninsula today was with their kindergarten. We have a lot of kids that are in this kinesthetic learning experience, but yet we're trying to get them to add three and two. We're not ready for that because we haven't even developed this level. I wouldn't ask you in reading to read a book that's way above your level. If you didn't have it, I would go through the developmental layers of looking at it. So it's the same idea, um, you know, in the area of math. The top part of our pyramid looks at what we call, if you kind of look at these letters, C, P, A. Teachers get sick of me saying that, but math should always be taught even if you're older, through CPA. That means concrete, pictorial, abstract. Concrete could be conceptual, which I'll talk about that in a minute. Pictorial is representational. So you may have heard this as CRA. Um, and then the abstract. If you look at this pyramid, you and I, and I can't see all your faces, but I'm pretty sure that most of us learned at the top of the pyramid in the abstract. We were with math told, how to follow the procedure. We were never, if you asked why, my teacher just said just because. Um, I never will forget when I was multiplying uh, or dividing fractions, they just said, um, don't ask why, invert and multiply. And I'm like, I don't get it. It doesn't matter, just follow the procedure, right? So I have tons of free videos on why you invert and multiply using pattern blocks that you can check out for free on our website. But I learned in the abstract, no one told me the why. I didn't know why I had to get X alone. I didn't get it. And so when we teach in our teachings through Molding Math Mindsets, we teach teachers how to peel the layers back. And I want every elementary teacher in our project schools to know for numeracy, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, fractions, word problems. I want them to know the CPA. We had some fifth graders yesterday that were struggling with division. Do we know how to go back in the CPA to help kids to understand that concept? To give you like a super quick idea of what CPA means, this is a very simple first grade concept. Um, the concrete means conceptual. It means a double 10 frame. It might mean a wreck and wreck, or it might mean our counting buddies, if you're familiar with those. Um, it's a way that we can conceptualize or think of a problem like eight plus three. So I have eight in the top 10 frame and five in the bottom. Um, a lot of kids right now are going and saying one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Um, a couple kids have told me to this week, or it was last week, that this was 85. Um, lots of lots of like numeracy that's not really there. But we know this is eight on the top and five at the bottom. What is a way that you can tell me how many it is total without one to one counting it? Well, we know that we can decompose, which is where my friend DC has come from. Um, our DC likes to take his hammer and he likes to decompose numbers to make friendly numbers. And so he's decomposing the five into two and three, two, which you can kind of see in the discs. If I push two up, I'm making a 10, eight plus two is 10 plus the three. So it's getting to look at an algorithm like eight plus five and to think of it in a friendlier way of 10 plus three, stopping students from pounding and counting on. Kids in fifth grade are saying eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, or they're doing this. 9, 10, 11. And I was like, what are you doing? Your nose counting? Like, so I mean, kids are just looking at numbers as one to one, which means they're not conceptually really putting any of this in their brain. And so the foundations for numeracy development truly start with students being able to understand things in a conceptual way where they can picture it in their brain. Students that I was screening today said to me, hey, I knew that there was eight on that 10 frame because there's two empty because 10 
Takeaway two is eight. Without me showing them any algorithm, kids have the rich numeracy language that we're looking for based on what they're what they're kind of seeing in these different um, parts to it. So what I want to kind of talk about in this area of conceptual understanding is to make sure that our early childhood educators and even our fifth graders on fifth grade teachers understand how these layers develop. So many people in the United States have heard of subitizing. Um, and I always ask teachers, is subitizing a mathematical milestone? Subitizing means tell me how many you see without counting. Um, and there is a book anywhere. Um, you know, I is when I do national presentations maybe eight or nine years ago, um, the word subitizing was kind of new or people hadn't heard what a wreck and wreck was. Um, and so subitizing, there's no checklist in early childhood that says if you can subitize, you're going to be extra smart. The math concept that we're talking about is called conservation to a number. So I have five fingers. I'm not going to grow any more fingers, and I surely hope I never lose any, <laughs> but this is five right? When a child is adding five and two, even though the child knows it's five, what do they do? One, two, three, four, five. Wait, honey, how many was that? Five. Okay. What's five and two? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or they say five and two, depending, right? Um, so it's called conservation to a number is that I, this is never going to change. It's, it's five. And you can, you can bank on that. One hand is going to have five if you have five fingers, right? So we have a lot of kids that are depending on one-to-one -one counting and they are not developing conservation to a number even working with third graders this week that don't have conservation to 10 without going back to count. This is sort of like behind the numbers. Everything that I'm going to show you here, I will never show you a digit. I won't show you a symbol. I will show you a quantity that I want kids to get really good at and having it in the conceptual part of your brain. So if you've watched any of our Math Might shows on the Michigan Learning Channel, um, our kindergarten teacher, and first grade teacher in those shows that I wrote, um, they all, almost all of them will include a numeracy talk. Numeracy talk should be happening in classrooms seven to 10 minutes a day, three to five times a week. And we should screen kids to know where they are in numeracy so that we're building the skills to help this. So I'm going to test our skills to get you the idea of that we don't just subitize by like flashing different um, patterns of dots and asking how many you saw really quick. The idea of conservation is to tell me how many without counting. The strategy is subitizing, which is I'm going to flash something to you quickly and I want to pull it away. And I want you to tell me how many you see without counting. So we start this at a young age within conservation to five. It's one of our biggest layers in our training that we teach is that kids have to have conservation to five. If I, I have lots of recordings, lots of videos. We have a huge membership community on our website, on our SIS membership, um, that we have lots of video footage of kids saying things like, hey, I know that that is four. Now, in the subitizing way, I would flash that to you quickly and I would pull it away. Why would I pull it away? Because if I leave it, they're going one, two, three, four. I don't want kids to do that. I want kids to look at it and say it's four and then use that visual memory to say, I know it's four because there's one missing. It's a five frame and it has five. Kids have said, I know that it's five or four because it's two and two. I know that it's four because it's three and one. Now we used to, 10 years ago, when we developed our screeners say, yeah, if you could do the five frame, like you totally have conservation to five. But instantly when I would turn the five frame this way and flash it away, what do you think kids would do? I would think, they would say four. No, they don't. It's our kids don't transfer their skills well. They see it one way and then now it's vertical and they're like, 10? Is it, was that 10? No, was it five? And it's like, honey, you, you knew it this way. Why don't you know it this way? So in our screener, we screen students to see if they have a five frame horizontal or a five frame vertical. And then can I show you a five frame in a scattered configuration? So it could be a dice, a domino pattern, but only up to five. So if a student is seeing five without counting, hopefully this one, they're seeing three and one. Some kids might see I saw two and two, but at the end of the day, a child can verbalize 
why they know what they know, which is the level of conservation to five. As we continue and kids get good at, we should be able to do all kinds of numeracy talks in our preschools and our kindergarten classrooms to be able to get kids to be flashed something like this. And then I say, I want to know what one less was than what you saw. If you're not taught kindergarten, you probably think that's kind of easy, but it's not. For kids to think of that there were four and they have to take away one, how many are there now? They have to say, oh, I think there's three, but that, that's not what happens in the classroom. Other questions you could ask kids is how many are empty or I'm going to flash this to you. Now tell me what one more is than what you saw. So asking open-ended inquiry-based questioning during our numeracy talks is one of the really big concepts that we're trying to teach. Another area is called conservation to 10. And we screen for this. All of our first graders are screened on this to make sure that they have this. They're flashed different images of 10 frames. 10 frames, in my opinion, are very overused in a lot of our early childhood classrooms because the kids seeing there's five at the top and two at the bottom. I know it's seven. It's there's three empty. So if there's 10, I know. Some kids will see a dice pattern over here of four and then three more. But when I change the configuration of this, it's 10, but it's on a linear, kids go back and do what? Wait, 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 what? I, I just knew seven on that 10 frame really good, but that, hold on. One, two, three, they go back to counting. And so we use a variety of tools that we use in numeracy. Um, one of them that you may have seen on the Math Might Show is our counting buddies, which we have sets of these in all of our preschool and kindergarten classrooms. This little guy has a cute little face and he's got cute little feet um, and our beads move on a macrame beaded system. So kids should be able to look at that and be able to see that they see a five group and two more or many kids when I screen them say, oh, there were three that weren't used. So I know that that is seven. This is a different structure looking at 10, but we want to make sure kids are able to do this with not just the 10 frame. And so the counting buddy or the first row of a wreck and wreck is a really great way to help kids get the linear sense of this. Again, I could flash this to you and say, hey, what was one less than what you saw? Hmm, how many beads weren't used? I call it a secret question during our numeracy talks that we model in schools. And if kids have that, teachers have that picture of what they're showing, kids take a picture with their brain camera. And then we say, okay, I'm going to ask you the secret question. I am forcing kids to use their conceptual part of their brain to remember the structure of seven. And Mrs. McCartney just asked me what two less is. Oh, I know that it's five. It's not taking my fingers and two less, and then counting. Very different um, concept there when we're looking at it. The other area is a scatter. We no longer screen in the scattered configuration for numeracy, but I will tell you, I have been working with some kindergartners in the most profound. Uh, we have a lot of schools like in the, the Bangor, like uh, we work with Midland, Standard Sterling, All Gray, uh, Saginaw Township area. We've been screening some of the kids in the area this year. And I I, I flashed this to a kid and he literally did this. He goes, you took away two. He goes, it's seven. He's five. This kid is five. I'm like, what do you mean, honey? How do, how do you know that it's seven? And he goes to this, he goes three, three and three is nine. You took away two. So it's seven. That a child can look at a configuration and tell me that is huge. Other kids say, no, nope, I didn't think of it that way. Mrs. McCartney, I saw five like a dice and then two. That's how I know. Another child says, nope, that's not how I thought of it. I saw four and three. I see it that way. Another kid says, I saw six and one or three, three and one. At the end of the day, this is the very beginning building of the character DC that you can see kind of pictured behind me in his Halloween costume, is that we are literally taking the number seven and composing it. We are showing that seven can be decomposed into five and two. Seven can be decomposed into four and three. Seven can be decomposed into six, one. If kids are learning this at a really early age without digits, it's very important because it's helping strengthen their area of numeracy.
in our layer of conservation, as you can imagine, this just keeps kind of growing as kids get in. Every second grade student is screened on conservation to 20. If they fail it, they go back to 10. If they fail it, they go back to conservation to five. If they fail it, they go back to the kinesthetic layer. We have to find, this is all phonemic awareness for math. If you're do anything with literacy, you know all about, say the word cat, now change the last sound in cat to p -k -at -p. that's what we're doing in the area of math. When a child changes the last sound in cat to cap, I didn't write that word on a three by five card anywhere. The kid didn't see any of it. Where is it happening? It's happening in the conceptual part of their brain. This is the same area that's missing. So many of our programs that I see are missing the phonemic awareness in math. And that's what this layer really is all about. So getting a kid at the end of kindergarten to have conservation to 20 or making sure that our second graders can do this, I know that that is 18. I see a group of 10 and I see a group of eight. This is the birth of our character value pack that's on the Math Might Show. Value pack decomposes by place value. And if he was making this number, the tens would have a one, which represents 110, and then the, the ones would have the eight on it. And so our, our value character eventually turns into the strategy called partial sums. Um, as you get into first grade, they start decomposing by place value, um, but getting kids to be able to look at that and say that it's 18 and they know. Additionally, getting kids to do this on our counting buddy senior, which our counting buddy senior is obviously the bigger counting buddy um, that has 10 of one color and 10 of another. So that if kids were to be able to see 10 of one color and 10 of another, they would be able to look at that amount and see that there are 13, 10, and three. And so we will use different, um, different tools to kind of help kids to get these concepts. Um, and then our last tool that we're gonna use is a wreck and wreck. Um, and so we kind of create um, mass salad bars for schools that um, every kindergarten teacher has a certain tools that go with our numeracy trainings and things that we do to help um, them have it. So we use the, these are my favorite. They're like little mini rec and recs um, that we give a class set to, but that a kid could, you know, have um, 13 and they could tell how many they see. We do a ton of parent nights. I wrote a whole book um, on our website that I'll have tutorial videos um, on how to use a wreck and wreck in a classroom in K2. Um, a lot of people sort of think that the wreck and wreck does this. They're not really sure what to do with it. <laughs> so we kind of explain how to use that as a numeracy tool. Um, but early on, one of the things that we use it with is, um, is this. And then eventually we go up even higher. We go up to conservation to 40 on uh, 40 and a 10, for 10 frames so that kids start to build this into place value. You could see that that's 33. And then even an abacus. Can an adult look at that and tell me that that's 71? Not everyone when they're looking at that might have to count to see. This is called conservation to 100 and kids should master this by the end of their first grade year. So we have a ton of work, in my opinion, to do in the United States and other places in the area of numeracy. Um, and so one of our characters on the math mites we kind of call it our for our math for littles is Dotson who appears on the math mite show he's a lot in the kindergarten and parade show um kids all over are familiar with Dotson and um love playing our deco dots and our deco dot games are kind of four decks of cards in one obviously we screen our kids first to find out where they are in numeracy and then they play with our deco dot um, cards we have five conservation to five where students will work in our red deck which is consists of all five frame cards and then half of our green deck consists of scatters to five so if you're in the conservation to five you'd be playing Playing lots of differentiated games in the classroom using deco dots. They go all the way up to third grade, although I've had fourth and fifth grade teachers come up with games for it. If you're on conservation to 10, you'd use our yellow deck, all 10 frames. And then our other higher part of our green deck is going to do all kinds of games that look um, at that. And so on our website, you can view all these videos um, for free. If you just search under our deco dot series there, you can... Um, Find all the different games you can play, Deco Dot Difference, Deco Dot 
Duel, Deco Dot Same Last More. These are really great games. They all come with accountability sheets for, uh, we do a lot with Math Workshop with our schools and we differentiate the levels based on where kids are in the screeners. We do all kinds of activities with our Rec and Recs and Counting Buddies, um, our numeracy talks. There's a ton of stuff that we're doing in the classroom uh, to really help um, you know, get kids. We have number talks that are happening in our second through fifth grade classrooms, um, but in our preschool kindergarten in the, for the most beginning part of first grade, we're doing numeracy talks that all go through this explicitly um, on our website with our numeracy talk levels that we, um, that we do to help really strengthen this area. Kids will do things with building on clear sleeves with two-sided counters, um, and they're asked lots of different questions. What's one more? What's one less? What's two more? What's two less? How many were empty? Getting inquiry-based questioning for kids to not only just memorize the 10 frame, but to be able to tell us, um, you know, more about that. So if you're interested in our numeracy talks, deco dots, um, it's really important that you understand the layers of numeracy if we're going to make sense of what the other parts of what we kind of show um, you know, look at. So a lot of our teachers are a part of our M Cube membership, which um, has over 250 tutorial videos. You also have access to every single MathMite show and all the pieces that I built um, from the PowerPoint that I used in the show to um, all the different strategies and games and things that are were used to develop the show are in our um, membership. And so I wanted to take some time kind of at the end here um, to remind you of our, our shipping code and joining us on social media, but also to answer any questions, whether you want to unmute or if you want to, um, you know, put it in the chat um, to kind of to see sort of what, um, you know, where you're from and how numeracy is going, where you're at, or maybe what some takeaways were or some things that you're already doing that I talked about. So Cassie asked um, how important is it that the poly spots are in one color? Um, it doesn't matter. The ones that we sell typically, my that set that you saw is like my oldie but goodie set that happened to be like a rainbow set. Um, but the, I think the ones that like our teachers get, we primarily give them yellow um, ones and we actually put stickers on them now. Um, and so they are, um, you know, they're just on there. The, the poly spots themselves, one through five, typically are in a dice pattern, six through 10, I'll put it in like a 10 frame. So five at the top and one more, five at the top and two more. Um, but the color shouldn't matter because what we're assessing is whether or not they have the kinesthetic one-to-one. -one. Are you counting and corresponding your feet, um, you know, with it? And Sherry, I'm glad that you found the information helpful. And Jerry, I'll be in Jerry's district in All Gray Sims coaching um, next Tuesday. And uh, we did some modeling in your classroom with, um, with, with CPA. We used our place value discs and helped some of her students get that. And I think did a number talk in your classroom that turned out really well with the math mites as well. Well, I certainly hope that if you, um, you know, Get the, get the chance to go on the SIS for Teachers website. Um, you know, we have the Math Might Show. That's kind of part of what we, um, you know, what we what we do or what we did and still have out there um, and are, are really excited to be partnering with, um, you know, with our um, friends at Michigan Learning Channel. But there are so many ways that you can search on our website. Of course, we have a membership side that has a lot more than this. But, you know, certain things, if you're looking to, you know, learn things more about fractions and you want to watch some of our free, you know, tutorial videos on how to divide fractions or how to do fraction talks, there are a ton of um, just great things on here. We have all different um, series that we did during COVID. I did an SIS for students series that is all free. Um, math games, number sense. We do real life problems with our friend, Professor Barbel from the Math Might Show. We do a whole thing on mystery math mistakes. Um, and so any of these things, you can go on, click on it, go up to our series. This is our SIS for Student series. Um, and I am showing you along with my friends uh, that are down in Indiana. Um, they, they did this together with me right when COVID started. And we have all kinds of just great games. And if you want it, just literally click, you know, click on it and you have got it. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for sharing, Shannon. That was really yeah, awesome. Absolutely. Buddy, Learned a lot.
Thanks so much. You guys have a great evening. Thank you. Bye, everyone.